Well, praise God. God bless you, everyone, and welcome to Gary Costello Live. Wow. Hope you had a great Easter. We've just had the most amazing weekend at Awesome Church. Uh, Good Friday was such an amazing meeting. And uh, then on Sunday yesterday, wow, it was just really such an anointed meeting at church. And I want to encourage those that um, perhaps weren't at church or if uh, you're somewhere else around the globe and you you want to see a powerful service, why don't you go to our YouTube channel and look up Awesome Church Sydney and I can guarantee you, you're going to feel the presence of God. It was absolutely sensational. So I really pray and hope that you had a wonderful Easter wherever you are. I really pray that you had a great time. Well, I want to also say thank you to everybody who's been responding to um, this new podcast. And um, I've had people all over the world email me and send me messages just to encourage me and just to say that they've really been blessed with the guests that we've had over the last few weeks. And tonight is going to be a really special night because uh, I have the privilege of interviewing an old buddy, an old friend. We go back a long time ago, um, probably something like, well, over 30 years, maybe something like 35, 36, 37 years, so a long time. And um, it's just such a thrill when you meet people and uh, you, you reconnect with people from your past that um, where you were not saved, we weren't Christians. And, um, and then to reconnect in the faith and to, and to just really see what God has done um, within our lives, it's just really special. So tonight is special, and um, I'm really privileged to have good friend Mark Stevens. Praise God. Some of you may remember Mark um, way back in the 80s and the 90s, and we're going to share a little bit more about his fame and what he did and um, just what God has done within his life. Um, And, um, you know, we're Christians now. We love Jesus. We serve the Lord. And um, the Holy Bible is, uh, is, is God's book that we live our lives and uh, uh, towards. And um, I wanted to share a scripture tonight, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this. Perhaps you're not a Christian and you're intrigued about this interview with Mark, um, or maybe you are a believer. It doesn't matter. I just want you to listen to this psalm, the book of Psalms from the Holy Bible, written by King David. King David was the king of Israel at that time, but he was also a worshiper, and he wrote many songs. He wrote many psalms. Mark Stevens is a worshiper. Uh, I'm a worshiper. And when I was reading this uh, today, I just felt the presence of God uh, on my life for Mark and also for everyone watching this tonight, particularly those who have a story of how they found Christ. Um, It's Psalm 40, and I want to read this to you, just a portion of it, and then I'm going to welcome Mark live from the UK. I'm in Sydney, Australia. He's in the UK, United Kingdom. And Psalm 40 goes like this. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works, which you have done. And your thoughts towards us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice an offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness 
in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. O Lord, you yourself know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. And on that note, I want to welcome my dear friend from way, way, way back, Mark Stevens. God bless you, Mark. <laughs> Gary Costello. Oh, it is so good to be here. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's just been a joy to reconnect with you, man. And just to know that you've got a spectacular church called Awesome Church in right. Sydney, Australia, the Promised Land. <laughs> yeah, the Promised Land. Absolutely. You know it. And um, yeah. And so where are you in the UK? Let us know where you are. Yeah, so I'm uh, in a place called West Yorkshire, um, which is north, uh, a little ways north of Manchester, uh, in a place called Bradford. Uh, Bradford uh, was uh, a very industrial town. And um, so, uh, yeah, the, it's got a great demographic of a, a mixture of different cultures here. I think there's about 600,000 people in this city and then 2 million in Leeds, which is the neighbouring city, and they merge together. So uh, it's a great place to, to be in. Yorkshire is very, very pretty. There's lots of lush green fields and uh, lots of rain, unfortunately, as well. But <laughs> <laughs> you don't get as much sunshine as you. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, we had a lovely day in Sydney today. It was absolutely sensational. Went out with right. the family went to the city and we had just um, just a wonderful time. So oh, it was yeah. good. And you're waking up right now. Well, yeah, yeah. I've, I've woken up. My kids actually had a sleepover last night. To, um, one of their cousins is in from Switzerland and they had their other co cousin over. So it was chaos at my house <laughs> uh, this morning, trying to get them out the door before I, I did this to get some peace and quiet. But, yeah. Oh, <laughs> so it's all good. Listen, happy Easter, by the way. Thank I know you. Thank you. And Happy same with you. Happy Easter. And uh, it's the most important feast in the Christian calendar. It was, uh, you know, without the cross of Christ, none of us would have any hope. We wouldn't be here today if it no. wasn't for what Jesus Christ did for us. No, that's right. And and trying to convey that to this generation is a, is a challenge within itself. You know, many people are unchurched, particularly in this country. So, you know, uh, conveying that message of hope to them is uh, is is a work within itself. But, um, you know, I'm committed to that process and I'm committed to the Lord 100 percent. And I believe it's my responsibility to be able to, to, to do that. And it's a joy to be able to do that. Absolutely. And, you know, Psalm 40, which I just read. Right. And I was just thinking about you when I read that that King David, who was a worshipper like you, and he says in Psalm 40 that he did not conceal, he did not hide the righteousness that he had discovered in Christ, in God. And, um, and that's why we're doing this tonight. You know, we're not concealing, we're not hiding what God has done in our lives, and we thank God for that. Well, you and I both know, you know, when God does lift you out of such a dark place or a miry, a miry clay and set your feet upon a rock, you know, it's it's something to shout about. But I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people um, start well in their faith, and then that shout gets quieter and quieter. The more they move on through their their life, they get sidetracked or they get slapped upside the head by circumstances or or people along the way, and that that kind of shout it dissipates and shrinks. But so you've got to be committed to the process of ensuring that you stay free, you stay strong, you stay on that rock, which is Christ, and you keep declaring um, all that he's done uh, in your life. So, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, man. Yeah. Well, we've got so much to talk about. Your journey is absolutely sensational. It's such a great story. And, it's yours, uh, it's yours, yours man. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, thank you. But, um, but I want people to hear about, you know, it's it's so good to hear people's journeys in life, you know, and because uh, a lot of people give up, a lot of people quit, a lot of people think there is no hope. 
sometimes people have been involved in something and that comes to an end. It could be a marriage. It could be a relationship. It could be a business. And they, and they, and they want to give up. They feel like quitting. Your story is a story of someone who did not quit. Right. And in that, and I don't want to give too much away, but within that, there's a great ending. And, and, but for God, you know, God, and, and right. what he's in our lives. Amen. 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 And, uh, you know, like I said before, I think, you know, people do start strong, but they, they end up going, going wayward. So you, you've got to, you've got to build things into your life that ensure that you do keep strong. The Bible yeah. says, guard your heart for yeah. out of it flow the issues of life. Um, so guarding your heart, caring for your heart, your soul, your, your mindset and the narrative that you live your life by is, is a work of art within itself. And I think that's where people um, more often than not fail who go wayward. You know, they, they don't look after their heart, their inner life. And um, by ensuring you build healthy boundary lines or, you know, you, you're feeding your heart, your mind the right thing. So if you can keep doing that consistently, um, you know, you're going to live out your best life. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Um, well, I just want to play something just for those that uh, uh, just may not know who you are, but there'll be plenty of people who know exactly who you are. Uh, just a short clip here, and then we're going to go, we're going to break it down, and we're going to go to all these different um, uh, segments of your life, oh. which is so fascinating. So um, I hope uh, you'll be okay yeah, and you won't cringe too much, but uh, this is, uh, have a look at this. this. This is really good. Oh, here we go. Uh, look, oh. they're crying there already. <laughs> when you wake up tomorrow, you're at your door. This is the way to heaven. I got this chance to say that I do believe. I worship at your throne, whisper my own love song with all my heart. I say, <laughs> I love it. And now look at me. I'm over 50. <laughs> I'm I know. Doing my hair while I've still got it. <laughs> yeah, I know, mate. We all had that mullet back then, didn't we? But um, I love well, it. Uh, um, we're still doing well. Praise God for that. I'm strong, man. I'm strong. Oh, you man. look strong, and I'm, I'm up for it. Come on. Come on. on. Now, yeah. let's begin the journey. So you grew up what we affectionately call the Apple Isle, and that's uh, Tasmania. Uh, yeah. and, and Tasmania is part of Australia, and Absolutely. that's right at the southern end, and it's a little apple-shaped island just beneath Victoria. And uh, so tell us, the only other person that I know that is <laughs> as famous like you was Errol Flynn. He was from Tasmania. <laughs> I don't know of anyone else other than Errol yeah. Flynn and Mark Stevens. Tell us about what it was like growing up in Tasmania. Well, I mean, I think Tasmania gets a bit of a bad rap, uh, but, you know, my family are there now, you know, my mum, my dad and my brother, my sister lives in Melbourne, but um, it was beautiful to, to grow up there. It's, it was quite isolated, as you can imagine. The uh, population is still pretty much the same, which is less than half a million people in quite a large landscape there. So um it was it was quite a beautiful place to grow up you know everybody knew each other on the street everybody looked after each other on the street and uh, which is a rarity these days um but it was great I, I, you know i think the only the only negative at the time was the fact that we didn't have any god consciousness in our family so um i think my mum did have a faith but it wasn't expressed because my father didn't have a faith uh, with Christ, grew up in the Catholic church system and, and um, yeah, didn't really enjoy church as a kid. So he kind of strayed. And, and um, so God wasn't really talked about in our home. Nonetheless, it was a fun home. It was full of music. It was full of laughter. Kids from, you know, around the neighborhood were always at our home. You know, we formed, I formed a band when I was 11 or 12. So music was always my sanctuary, my place that, you know, I'd go to my room and I would sing and that's what I would do. And I would write songs. And, and uh, so, yeah, it was very much like that. 
Was anyone else musical in your home? Where did that come from? Where did that musical muse yeah, come from? Mum and dad were both musical. Um, my mum actually used to be a singer and used to oh. sing on like, cruise, cruise ships and stuff years oh. before. Um, but my brother is incredibly musical. He's got a phenomenal voice, uh, although he's, he's never used it in the entertainment business. Um, but he can still sing um, like you wouldn't believe. So, yeah, I think music was, um, was in the DNA. Mm, fantastic. Yeah. And so um, you started in the entertainment industry. Yeah. Um, really, uh, it was like an overnight kind of success. You got um, picked up by one of Australia's, um, it's called the Young Talent Time, and it was a program, a weekly program, uh, Johnny Young's Young Talent Time, that um, at one point, I believe, or it still may be, the longest-running TV show in Australia's history. I know it was for at one particular uh, part of uh, time, but it may still yeah. be. Um, and uh, you got picked up after winning a contest in Hobart, and uh, you were flown to Victoria, to Melbourne, and, uh, and the next moment, you are now a teen idol on the Australia, one, of my, one of Australia's most popular TV shows. Absolutely. I think, you know, for, for people listening who are outside of Australia, a, a Young Talent Time, well, there we go. Whoa. Young Talent Time was like Australia's version of the Mickey Mouse Club. It was 10 team, team members. There we are. Uh, singing the hits of the day, singing, dancing with the host of the show and creator and producer of the show, Johnny Young. Um, so it was iconic. Uh, it had a viewing audience of over a million people, which was, uh, you know, one twentieth of the population, which is a huge uh, demographic. And uh, yeah, it was popular. Um, I, think, I think it was Australia's most popular show at the time. Um, but yeah, I, so I wrote a song. And it, I won a talent quest. And like you said, Gary was flown into Melbourne, auditioned for the show. And, and almost overnight, my family moved from Tasmania to Melbourne, Australia, to give me the opportunity of a lifetime to work on this iconic show. Um, uh, we would do tours. I think I met you on, on one of the tours up in Sydney. And, you know, we would be doing major cities, you know, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, all around Australia. Uh, with four or five or six shows back to back with, you know, 15,000 people in the audience night after night. So it was that kind of level of show. You couldn't walk down the street with, without being chased by, by girls. I love that. <laughs> 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 I thought, I thought I, you know, I was a rock and roll star, but um, <laughs> so it was, it was, it was fun. But at, on the other end of the spectrum, it was quite isolating and uh, to be at school like a normal kid was was a real challenge because uh, obviously, you know, you used to get a lot of trouble at school. So I didn't enjoy school, but, um, but there you go. That was it. But it, it was quite, for, for those that are not aware of it, look it up online. I believe there are, there are probably programs on YouTube that you can check it out. I mean, uh, from my um, uh, involvement uh, outside of the team, but just being involved with people within the team, it's interesting the, the work ethic that you guys had was absolutely phenomenal. The amount of, um, uh, if you look at the show and you see the songs and the dancing and the choreography and the way that it was presented on a weekly basis, right? How, and you guys are all at school, how you guys did this, I don't think it's possible, it wouldn't be possible today, but yet week in and week out, you're presenting this nationally you know, syndicated um, television program, uh, it must have been a lot of pressure. Did you feel that pressure or how did you manage to get through that? Well, I think you, I think as a kid, you've got so much energy anyway. And, and you know, so I, I think the energy was there, but the, the commitment was, was massive, not just from the team members, the kids, but from the producers and, and directors and everyone, particularly people like Maggie Burns, who was the choreographer, I mean, God knows how she did it, but she worked with, you know, 10 kids whose heads were all over the place. So, um, you know, I mean, good on her for, for sticking at it. <laughs> but, yeah, it was a massive commitment. I think three or four nights a week. Uh, there were two nights 
of rehearsals. We did a full Saturday. So when everyone was playing down the road, kicking a football, we were rehearsing for a Sunday live show. So it, our weekends were just taken, you know, for four years. I mean, it was like having a full-time job outside of, you know, a full-time school life yeah. as well. And, and at the time, you know, earning more than your parents, um, <laughs> which, was a, which was a good thing, but it was a, weir a weird thing as well. So uh, I guess the financial aspect as a kid was, was, was great, you know. Um, but, yeah, it was a massive commitment, but I loved it because it created a strong work ethic uh, in me. Mm. And I say to my kids, you know, who asked me to make their sandwiches or whatever, I'm saying, no, you make your sandwich. At your age, I had a full-time job, so you can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, it was, look, it was a terrific show. And, um, and uh, you know, you, you've really got to give credit where credit is due. And the whole team and the way that they were able to perform in such professionalism week in and week out, I saw it firsthand. It was phenomenal. And uh, so I encourage people, have a look at YouTube um, and you can uh, see Mark and the whole team having a great time. So now you're on YTT for a number of years. And I believe once you hit 18, you had to leave. Is that right? I think it was 16. 16, 16 wasn't it? Okay, right. Yeah, you had to leave. So I hit 16 and um, I got myself an agent. Gary, thinking that my agent would help me with my singing career, and, and she got me an acting audition for a soap opera called Neighbours, uh, yeah. which has just come off Australian television. Oh, my Lord. Where did you find that? I wish I had that much hair now. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I worked, uh, I auditioned for Neighbours for um, a part uh, called Nick Page. He was a young graffiti artist slash artist, you know, tear away, uh, quite a rough kid. Um, so, yeah, and won the part. And wow. did that for nearly three years I worked on Neighbours. And then uh, after Neighbours, well, I worked with Jason Donovan, uh, Craig McLaughlin, Ian Smith, who did Harold, you know, Anne Charleston, who did Madge, Anne Hattie, who did Helen, uh, Alan Dale, who did Jim, a whole host of, of the original cast. So that was incredible. Me not being an actor was like a learning curve, uh, and I absolutely loved it. I loved that show. And Neighbours was an international program, not just nationally syndicated. It was actually international. It had a viewing audience of 20 million people. Wow. Wow. Night after night. In, in the UK, uh, the, 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 the level of interest in the show was was outrageous um so i mean everyone was coming to the uk on the back of their time with neighbors or during it to do pantomime to do theater so pantomime is like a really popular family thing at christmas time over here in the uk everyone flocks to the theaters to see a christmas show it's just the thing you do um so yeah a lot of the neighbors cast had the opportunity to come into the uk because Neighbours opened up a, a wider world platform for everyone to enjoy uh, the benefits of. So that was cool. So I did the same. Came to the UK. It was a long swim. Yeah. Did you find acting different to singing and performing or did they merge somehow? <clears throat> they merged. I think they merged. Uh, although acting, uh, there's so many different things you need to learn to be an actor. Um in terms of your, your approach to the performance or the character, whereas with a song, you're conveying the heartbeat of the song as you. But with acting, you, you're performing as a different character. But I think the, the ethos, the, the discipline of learning lines, uh, you know, I was learning dance routines and learning, you know, songs on a weekly basis. So, so that really helped me. I mean, I can, I can learn scripts of, I mean, I've learned the word of God, you know, just psalm after psalm, page after page, and it's just embedded in me, and I could just reel stuff off. Because of that early discipline, I think it formed something in my mind that um, has really helped me in my faith as well. Well, it, it, that's great. I mean, it's but it's still, I mean, it's. A, I just find it fascinating that at such a young age, in your teenagers, teenage years and early 20s, um, 
without really any experience, going onto a national program, performing week in and week out, then going into an international um, soap opera, um, uh, acting, uh, I just find that fascinating that where did you get that from? Where did that come from, this ability to be able to perform, sing, write songs and then actually act with, you know, acclaimed actors? Where did that come from? You know, I just think, I think God's created us to be great at something. And for me, it's, it's music and being able to, um, to, to perform. I think I just, I find that as easy as breathing for me. I, I don't, you know, there's, there are no nerves involved for me uh, in that respect to, at the drop of a hat, do that. I don't know what that is. It's just, it's just in me. And, but, but, you know, some people have those gifts, but they don't have the opportunity. For me, I just seem to, the doors seem to open, but significant doors. And I think, um, you know, I, I don't know what it was. I, I'm still trying to figure it out, but I, I call it the hand of God um, in terms of his ability to be able to open a door for you that you could never manufacture in your own strength or even in your own credibility. I think just some things happen uh, and are orchestrated by circumstances outside of your control. That happened to me. So for Young Talent Time, I was on my way to my grandmother's house for lunch uh, and a young girl that I used to sing with at school in Tasmania mentioned a talent quest to me on a train track, actually, because I was taking a shortcut to my grand's house. And she said, have you heard about the talent quest? It's on tonight. You should put your song in that you've written. And so I went home and recorded the backing music on a cassette, took it down and boom, the doors open. And then I was put into the grand final, won that, boom, the doors open. It was just a series of events that, that led me into these arenas with amazing people, actually, um, who had <laughs> really worked at their craft for years. Yeah. to do what they were doing, and I'm, I'm, I'm there with them. And, and uh, it was like the imposter syndrome in many respects. Right. But feeling unusually ready for what was being served up uh, mm. to me and, and having the ability to be able to do it. Um, do you, so, can you remember back then, did you have, and I know it was a long time ago, but did you have any sense that there was some kind of divine activity happening or you were just caught up in the moment of it all? I think caught up in the moment of it all and not quite able to describe it. Um, feeling incredibly, I would, have, I would have said back then, lucky. You know, I'm just right, so lucky. Right, right. Oh, wow. And people saying, you are so lucky. And me feeling that, but me now knowing the hand of God is orchestrating. You know, the Bible says, uh, in Psalm 139 in verse 14, it says, all the days ordained for me were, mm. written, were written in your book before wow. one ever came to be. Wow. God has a book and it's, it's not just the Bible. It's, it's a book of events that are tailor made and orchestrated and ordained for your life that he's written before you were even born that you then live out in, in real time. And, so God's pulling the strings. He is the puppet master behind the veil who pulls the strings. Yes, you are making choices, but he's bigger than your choices. He's an eternal God knowing the end from the beginning. So I think that understanding fell on me in my mid-20s when mm. I really started to, um, when my eyes were beginning to be opened and I was beginning to see that, there's something bigger than me, you know, than everyone. There's something bigger behind this that's orchestrating events. It took a mm. long time to get there, though. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely come to that. Yeah. Um, but, but, folks, those that are watching, I mean, it's quite an extraordinary career. I mean, you've got a young person on a national program, international, um, and it was that around that time that you then got signed by BMG. And yeah. um, your your and your manager was Glenn Wheatley, who was John Farnham's uh, manager. Is that right? That's right. So towards the end of Neighbours, I wanted to sing again. You know, to go back into 
doing what I, I love the most, and that is singing and, and writing and what have you. So um, I had a couple of, I had uh, a guy called Daryl Braithwaite, his manager, I met with him and I met with Glenn. Oh, sure. you know, everyone knows Daryl Braithwaite. I mean, you, you make yeah. it sound like, you know, it's someone we don't know. That's a big <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How yeah. sad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so Daryl's manager, I actually was going to, signed with Daryl's manager, um, but I was such a massive fan of John Farnham and still am, and, and you know, God bless him. His, his health mm. has not been so great. I'm praying for that man. Um, so, yeah, I signed with Glenn Wheatley and uh, started to record my, my first record. There it is. This is a way to heaven. Now, that was recorded in the UK, and Glenn Wheatley was good friends with a guy called Kenny Smith, who managed the, the Eurythmics and London Beat. So I signed in the UK outside of Australia with Kenny Smith uh, and was signed to BMG, uh, RCA, BMG slash RCA, for a worldwide record deal and then worked with Nick Kershaw, wrote and produced that song. Hmm. So, uh, so I worked with Nick Kershaw. He wrote a song called I Won't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. Oh, right. Won't let the sun go down on me. Yeah, and that was, a, that was a massive hit in the 80s. Yeah. So, yeah, so all of these things started to happen. That was my first record. I I wrote and pretty much, you know, co-produced. Um, so that was my, my first Christian album, To Be With You, that I wrote. Um, yeah, and recorded here in the UK. And that was my, my second album called Bring Down Heaven. Um, I'm really proud of those two projects. There's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in those in those projects, and uh, some good songs on them as well. Yeah, absolutely. In my opinion. Um, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, look, you've got the world at your feet. <laughs> you've got um, a, a fabulous uh, uh, resume of um, singing, performing, national programs, international soap operas, uh, record contract stellar management um you've got the whole world at your feet um but uh things turned yeah. in a different direction for you um and uh what happened i think i think um genetically some people are more prone to addiction uh and have more of a, an obsessive nature towards one addictive personality i have that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to Jesus now, <laughs> the word of God, to prayer, yeah. to the presence of God, you know, and, and I, I outwork my, my leaning towards that obsessive nature in the things of God, in the things of faith. Back then, genetically, it was, you know, a leaning towards or a curiosity towards alcohol, um, which ran down my father's side of the family. There was a lot of addiction in my, unfortunately, in my father's side of the family, um, and then, you know, towards drugs as well. So from a young age, even back to young talent time days, you know, behind the scenes, not that everyone was doing that by any means, uh, you know, I had a tendency to want to drink. So I, I remember missing a show when I was fourteen. I think we were up in Queensland. Um, or on the Gold Coast somewhere doing shows. And, and I missed a, a huge show because I'd got drunk the night before wow. in my hotel room. That was a day when, you know, you, they forgot to clear out the alcohol out of the room. <laughs> and I took advantage of it. And I was horrendously sick and missed a show. But, but that in me started to, that quest for wanting to know what drugs were like or, and then being around people who should have known better who introduced me to that, you know, intro, being introduced to drugs always comes through a person or people. And, uh, you know, there are people, I believe that the enemy <laughs> right. uh, puts into our life at different, to try to destroy us. And um, that introduce you to, to things that you should keep away from. Unfortunately for me, I was, I was dabbling. So by the time I left, young talent time and I was involved in Neighbours, I had a pretty strong alcohol addiction 
and I was partying a lot behind the scenes. By the time I was 18, I was introduced to narcotics, to, you know, uh, cocaine, ecstasy. And then I, I moved 12,000 miles away from my home, away from the stability of friends and family around me who kind of protected me in a way. I was a long way from that. So it was party time. You know, I was earning a lot of money week in, week out. Um, and a lot of money was coming into the account but going out of the account, you know, to support, <laughs> in the end, a drug habit. Um, by the time I was 19, I was addicted to uh, cocaine, ecstasy, smoking dope every day and was, was a, I would say, a full-blown alcoholic. When I wasn't drinking, I was recovering from, from, from long binges. So, you know, by my early 20s, you know, I would turn up to my um, appointments and I'd be half cut, you know, or I'd be trying to record a new record and I just would not be able to do it vocally or I would turn up late or I would turn up to do an interview and I'd be drunk or I'd be off my head. And slowly the door started to close for me. Um, so by the time I was 25, I was living in London trying to get my career together. And I was, how, this is how low I got, Gary. I was selling stolen CDs to mm. cash converters, to cash converters to support a drug habit. Mm. Um, I was buying heroin. Um, I was smoking heroin. I was just so, so lost and absolutely broken. Uh, the addiction had taken the front seat and my sense of morality or sense of caring for myself took a back seat. This thing, just the, the addiction just grabbed me. Everything I did revolved around getting enough money to get six or seven pints in me, some heroin, and whatever else I could put in my body, and maybe a little bit of food here and there when I was, you know, hungry. It all revolved around that. All my relationships had dried up uh, in the industry, and I'd just gone wayward. And then the other relationships I had were just providing me with, with drugs and alcohol. Um, so, yeah, I, for, I think for about three or four years, my life was just a series of waking up, getting off my head and just passing out and then doing the same thing night after night after night, trying to get a career together, but, but just could not see through the fog and through the haze at all. Do, do you think that you mentioned at the time it was just, I mean, obviously on Young Talent Time, you're only young and, and, and neighbours. Um, it's It starts recreationally. Or do you feel like even back then there was something you were trying to escape or trying to numb or was it anxiety? What do you think it was? Or was it purely just it was recreational? But like they say, then the devil got the better of me. I think a combination, Gary, if I can be really honest to, to the listeners, um, there may be someone out there who, you know, can kind of resonate with what I'm about to say. Um I think as you get older, you know, the, your eyes become open to the circumstances that are around you. I think, you know, innocence and, and being young can shield you from a lot of, of stuff. But then Pandora's box starts to get open the more, you know, the, the innocence disappears in your life. And I think being exposed to a high level of fame and, and lots of money and um, lots of opportunities that most kids were just not exposed to. All of those factors uh, began to open my eyes. So, yes, it started rec recreationally, um, but also I think I was trying to escape definitely in, in my mid to late teens, the, the, the volatility of my, of my home, of the relationship between my mum and my dad, who I love so much, who had a horrible divorce, um, and lots of factors that crept in there. So the home, it, it didn't, wasn't a happy home. There, were, there was lots of elephants in the room and lots of things being swept under the carpet that broke my heart, broke my brother's heart and my sister's heart. 
So I think, there were, and my mum and, and of course my dad, there's a lot of brokenness there that we tried to, to hide. Um, my mum's now saved, by the way. She's full of the Holy Ghost and she's going on for Jesus. And when my brother gave his heart to the Lord and got baptised and my sister gave her heart to the Lord, although she's on a bumpy path and my, God's got to get my dad yet. Yeah. But um, So all of those factors pushed me away from a home that should have been stable. And I, I know that that's happening and has happened in lots of people's lives where your eyes become open and you just feel like you need to get out. Right. Fortunately, that that was where I was at. I just need to go. I need to go and do my thing. But that was <laughs> fueled by partying and, and the, the kind of season it was back in the 80s and 90s. You know, a lot of people were doing that. Yeah. They didn't really care about the repercussions. <laughs> So, um, yeah. so it was it was all that all those factors yeah. and no God consciousness, you know, no no relationship with the Lord and no great community around me who were leading me in the right direction. It seemed to be that everyone I was around was messed up or yeah. 90 90 percent of the people were fumbling through life, trying to figure it out uh, as well. So being surrounded by that, you, it's kind of. Um, you know, the, the chips are stacked against you in a way, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember the lowest point Yeah. in that hole? I do. I, I, I do. I do. I think for me the lowest point was living in London with a friend of mine, God bless her, uh, she worked for BMG RCA at the time. She was bringing these CDs home that I could sell to cash converters because I didn't have a job. My career had dried up. I didn't know what to do. You know, I'm like, do I go out and get a job at McDonald's or, you know, and I was too proud at that moment to do anything like that. I think a lot of people who are in the entertainment business, they, they become immune from reality. And then, you know, the, the ego and the pride takes over. So when they are at their wits end and they're broken, you know, they, they never think about going out and getting a, quote, normal job with normal people because they've had things served up to them on a plate in terms of a lifestyle that they've led. So they, they just become very, very isolated. I became isolated and therefore ended up selling those stolen CDs to cash converters rather than getting a job. I never would have been able to pin a job down anyway because uh, of my lifestyle. And then... Um, going back to this little hovel of a place I was living in that needed a good vacuum. <laughs> and it was dusty and horrible and I was getting sick all the time. And then smoking heroin off foil. And then when I'd done that, rolling a reefer and, and going to the pub, and I was doing that day in, day out. Mm. But then a series of, of events occurred in my life and, and God started to break in to my life at, at my darkest moment, you know, and of course, nothing seemed was seeming to get to get better at home in Australia either. It was it was just getting worse. So, where did the shining light come into your life? You know, I think, like I said, all the days are ordained ordained for you. You know, Psalm one three nine. I think I think God, if there's a cry in the heart. You know, God is a heart God um, who looks at the heart. He, he, he's not, he doesn't even concern himself uh, with the, the exterior. But if the heart cries out, he delivers, he comes. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, there was a heart cry of, I hate my life. I know I'm born for more than this. I look up at the stars at night and I know there's something more. What is it? Those questions started to, to land. I, I think, you know, for me, drugs opened up some, you know, a, a part of my brain where I did start to ask a lot of questions. And I'm, I'm thinking there must be more to life than all of this. As good as, you know, a wife and a kid might be that I'll have one day, hopefully, um, or a good job or whatever, blah, blah, blah. there must be more to life than this. So all of those questions were opening up 
the curiosity of of eternal things were opening up, but I never seemed to get my hands on the answer. Um, I met at one night in a dark, dingy little pub in London, I met a backslidden Christian girl. Hmm. And she was from Sydney, Australia. Wow. And she was in London working for a guy called uh, Michael Barrymore, who was a very, very famous man in the UK, probably the UK's most famous man, I'm talking 25 years ago, uh, who was uh, like a comedian slash iconic figure that hosted shows and all that kind of stuff. And so she was working for him, this girl I meet in a bar, and she comes up to me. She was very pretty, and she came up to me and said, hey, I'm such and such. Um, I used to watch you as a little girl on Young know, Talent Time in wow. Australia. She said, what on earth are you doing here? Wow. She just ended up in this bar, and I'm, and I'm like, what, are, what am I doing here? What are you doing here? More like it. Uh, and we became boyfriend and girlfriend. So she's a backslidden Christian. We date for a few months. And like every other woman previous to that, I because I had a very promiscuous life, um, like most people in addiction, you know, I broke up with her, but she went back to church <laughs> and started praying for me. There you go. <laughs> and then she would, she, would, she would visit the pub I was, would drink at once a week. And it was like her mission to get me saved. And uh, I didn't want to ha- know anything about it. But then strange things started to happen in my life. And um, uh, I, I remember having a, an unusual conversation with a priest on, on the road, on the way home, back from the pub one late evening, one summer evening, and saying to him, you know, I'm, I'm not enjoying my life. I am messed up. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I said, there must be more to life than what I'm experiencing. And he said, he said, young man, there is so much more. Mm. And he didn't tell me what the so much more was. He just left me with that question. So I kept asking people when I was drunk, what's the so much more? Yeah, <laughs> I said, this priest, hey, he didn't tell me what the so much more was. And, and everyone was like, I don't know what he what meant. Um, and then, uh, yes, yeah, several things started to happen to me. Uh, I, my eyes were open to the things of the spirit on, on one day, one occasion. I remember being on the Kilburn High Road in, in London, coming out of a fruit shop of all places with a, an apple in my hand that I was eating. And all of a sudden, I knew Every sickness, every mindset, it's like words of knowledge were just reels of it. As I was looking at people, I'm thinking, that person has got that infirmity. That person is thinking that. That person needs this. And it was like words of wisdom and knowledge coming into my mind, and it freaked me out. It wow. totally freaked me out. And hmm. then it lifted. it lifted from me. And I was asking my, my friends around me, are you seeing this? Yeah, I did, did, look, look at this person. And they thought I'd, they thought I'd gone nuts. Um, so, like, things were happening like that. Um, and then it came to my, led up to my salvation moment. R- remember, that girl was praying for me. With yes. Prayer. So prayer There's always power. someone praying. There's always someone praying. Yes. Don't ever yes. underestimate the power of your prayers out there if you're watching this and you're hearing this. And maybe you know you've got a loved one. Maybe you've got a son or a daughter or a family member or someone you care about that's an alcoholic or bound with drugs or just caught up in sinful living and you're wondering, what can I do? You can pray. Um, And uh, prayer has power. And uh, and so what happened next? You know, you you mentioned prayer. I remember Dr. Miles Munro, he said... Prayer, prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. And I'm like, oh, I love, love that. that. I love that. I love that. It's your earthly license yeah. for heaven to intervene. So, so, so church, if you're, if church, keep praying, keep yeah. praying, even when the heavens feel like brass, just keep Absolutely. praying. Because, it, I mean, uh, prayer wrecked me in a good way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, 
So this lady would, would she stayed a friend. God knows how she stayed a friend. I treated her so badly. And uh, I repented for weeks when I, be I became a Christian and apologized to her in a letter and said, look, I'm so sorry. Um, but she stayed a friend. So I was invited to a party at her home. Unbeknownst to me, it was an alpha party. <laughs> so she was so doing people that. don't know what alpha is, maybe just explain what that is. Yeah, so it's like, I think it's a 10-week course or an 8-week yeah, Right. Yeah. Introduction know. to Christianity and introduction right. to the things of faith. So yeah. she would have people at a house and they'd be taught and they'd pray and stuff. But then people would stay for hours after drinking coffee and talking about Jesus and the things of God. Anyway, so she kept inviting me. I didn't know it was an alpha course. So I turn up four hours late and I turn up to her home coming from a club with my drug dealer. And a friend of his, now I can't even remember their names, but they were sorry sights. I mean, and, and I'm, you know, chaperoned by these guys. I'm like, let's go to this girl's house. You know, we'll go and party and hopefully she'll have some, you know, alcohol. No, that was not what we found at all. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of knocked on the door. She opened up the door and took one look at me and just shook her head. And she said, come in. And so the, the three of us came inside. The two guys I was with went into her bathroom to do drugs. And they were actually walked in on by my ex-girlfriend's next door neighbor. And he was a big dude. And he kicked them out of the house for doing wow. drugs, for rolling up in, in, in her toilet. Wow. And um, so they were kicked out. All of this commotion is happening and I'm, I walked into the lounge room and I'm trying to like, get hey everyone. Hey, yeah. everyone's looking at me like a deer in a headlight, you know, like, who is this, who is this freaky guy? And, um, I remember the, the commotion happening, lose, uh, my ex-girlfriend walking into the lounge room and collaring me and just grabbing me and saying, come here, I need to speak to you half dragged me into a bedroom and I remember just cupping my head in my hand, sliding down her wall as she roasted me. She roasted me. First time she'd ever done that. What are you doing with your life? I am sick of this. You are destroying yourself. This is out of order. You, um, you're better than this, Mark, blah, blah, blah. And I, I just remember feeling like a shell of a man sliding down that wall. I remember it like it was yesterday. And these words came out of my mouth. This is so weird. I said to her, I said, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I think I need God. Whoa. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. I think, I think I need God. I had never, ever considered needing God. But it, it's like it just came out of my belly. And it was almost my spirit not engaging with my head and just saying these words. Then my ex-girlfriend said to me, she said, look, please do not go back to where you're living. She said, Mark, if you go back there, I don't think I'll ever see you again. And wow. I went, I said, don't be so, don't be a drama queen. Don't be stupid. You know, she, and then she shouted. She went, no. She's, you are not going back there. And I went, all right, all right. And she said, you're staying here the night. So that's what I did. When the house was cleared out, I stayed the night. I, I slept next to her on her bed. Nothing happened, by the way. Um, and I went into like a half comas toast state because I was half cut. And I passed out for four hours or so on her bed because by the time everyone left it was like three or four in the morning and then um i remember waking up to the sound of her voice speaking in a language i couldn't understand and she's pacing around the bed praying and she had the bible in her head i didn't know it was a bible she had a book and oh my god i get emotional thinking about it the presence of god was in the room 
And I just remember, because uh, I'd vomited a lot. I'd vomited that morning. And I'd, I was like retching vomit, vomiting because I ended the binge. And I'd covered myself in sick. So I was in my boxer shorts, wrapped in a sheet, sweating and shaking with just the smell of sick on me. I was, it was horrible. She cleaned me up through the night, by the way. And then uh, so she's praying as I wake, wake up. The room is filled with the presence of God. I'm wrapped in a sheet, smelling like sick. And then my eyes were open like that. At the blink of an eye, the click of a finger, I knew that I was in the presence of God. And my breath was taken away as I realized that he was in the room with me, that, that God was in, that Jesus was there. I didn't say Jesus. I, I, all I said Gary was, I said, oh, God. Wow. <laughs> and, and then I said, I'm sorry. I am sorry. <laughs> I am sorry. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. And I, uh, I still remember it, man. And I, I cried and I cried. I, I, <clears throat> uh, That's powerful. Sorry. That's powerful, man. That's powerful. I'm feeling it I too. I didn't have That's... any more tears to cry. Yeah. Uh, I cried and cried with joy and with um, in repentance, a deep, deep repentance of knowing he'd seen me as a little boy. He'd seen everything. He'd seen every flaw, every failing, every good thing, every high, every low. He'd seen me in, in toilets, in dark, dingy clubs, putting cocaine up my nose, he'd seen every promiscuous event, every perverted, he'd seen it all. And, 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 and he rescued me in that room that day. <laughs> and it, it, it amazed me, it took my breath away. And then that lady is, my ex-girlfriend is praying and she is caught up in the room and she sees the whole event. And then days later, I'm taken down to meet the pastors of her church, which was Hillsong Church um, in London. And I was taken down to meet the evan the associate pastor. He was a, an evangelist, powerful. He, 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 he traveled with Reinhard Bonnke for years. Uh, so this guy's got a serious anointing on his life, tangible anointing. And where he prayed for me when I met him and the tangible anointing of the Holy Ghost knocked me out. He, he, all he did was he said, Father, and lifted his hand. He went, Father. Wow. And the Holy Ghost just went, boom, knocked mm. me out in his office. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. And then he prophesied over my life about my future, my wife and my two children. He said, you're going to have a boy first and a girl, and I see your wife. You're going to be in ministry. And I, I, he just freaked me out. Anyway, that's a condensed version. I know I've talked a lot, so... <laughs> Wow. And um, okay. So brother, that's huge. I mean, that is really huge. Um, and so what happened? You became a member of the church. Is that, was that what happened? You began to then just as a complete change of life? Instantly. Well, yeah, instantly. I mean, I, I, I the, the, the senior, the associate pastor said, we've got to get you out of your ex-girlfriend's house immediately out of the way of temptation, blah, blah, blah. They put me in a home with two, a house with, not, <laughs> sounds weird, doesn't it? They put me in a house with two young bachelor guys who were on fire for Jesus. <laughs> I, I, I grew in my, all we did was fast and pray. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember one Saturday I was visited by angels. <laughs> that God. sounds freaky. As I worshipped for hours, um, again, the room filled with presence of God and, and angel, angelic beings came in the room and sang over me and um anyway that's a whole other story um but i got plugged into church and just got plugged into my faith felt like i'd come home and after three months i got involved in the worship team and then led worship but no longer was it about me it was about jesus and uh, that was like a total paradigm shift no more taking a bow like thank you very much it was all about thank you very much wow. <laughs> you know Thank you, Jesus. Let's celebrate him. And it, it made everything make sense. 
yeah. of why why we're being given the gift of music and blah blah blah, or any gift for that matter. Yeah. What what about the drugs and the alcohol? Did that take a season to get over to get cleaned up? What happened there? Instant, I mean, yeah, a major addiction. Yeah, instant deliverance. Instant deliverance. Instant. I wondered listen what I that, wanted. Folks, listen to that testimony, mm -hmm. folks. I mean, if you saw me, folks, and who I was and what I used to take and how much I used to drink and what, what I was on, you would think it would have taken months, if not years, to come off it instantly, delivered instantly. from yeah. every addiction, alcohol, drugs, uh, cigarettes, which I was really addicted to, um, filthy mouth that I used to have instantly every like the holiness of God came on me yeah. and I was quaking in my boots you know like oh I want to please him so it was like every foul thing just removed and it yeah. was supernatural so yeah so so set free and then um grew in my faith moved to Sydney where you are Australia for three and a half years to be a part of Hillsong Church out there on the back of the Shout to the Lord uh, era, that era of church. So that's around about 2000, year 2000, something around yeah. about there. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then the year, no, I moved over in 97. 97, uh, okay. And then the year 2000, I moved to the UK to marry my gorgeous bride. <laughs> <laughs> right Which we'll come to in a moment. Um, <laughs> I just want to come back. Uh, I just want to come back onto that deliverance. Let me call it a deliverance. Yes. Um, if you're not a Christian and you're watching this, we as believers, we believe what the Bible teaches. Jesus, the Bible says, went around doing good and healing and delivering all who were oppressed by the devil. The Amen. devil is real and yeah. he brings oppression. Addiction can be a demonic spirit. Now, yeah. demons are not something of mythology or folklore. They are real. They're, they're, they're in the Bible. You can read about demonic spirits and what they do. When And I've seen deliverance like yours, Mark. I've seen that happen as a pastor now. I've seen it happen a lot where people are instantly delivered from an addiction that they've had for years, maybe even decades. Um, and that tells me, it, it besides it being a miracle, yeah, it tells me that there's something else in them. There's an entity that's controlling them, that's fueling. Well, every every demon of addiction is a spirit of death, because yeah. a death spirit wants to destroy the person. Right. When that spirit is cast out, mm -hmm. you see instant deliverance. That's why it's called deliverance. You are delivered. You are set free. Yeah. That was a spirit. There's no question. Yeah, the Bible in Ephesians chapter 6, it, it talks about the wrestle not being against flesh and blood. Right. The, wrestle, the wrestle we fight in life yeah. is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities, yeah. powers, and they're talking about demonic forces, yeah. spirits, entities. Right. Um, so the wrestle is real. It's real, but it's a spiritual fight. You know that word principality, it means origin of thought. Wow, I love that. So, so taking on the origin of thoughts, because the Bible talks about the enemy, Lucifer, who was a fallen angel, Satan. Um, be, so he he infiltrates our life. That The Bible calls him the father of lies. Yeah. He infiltrates your life with a lie first, with deception. And it's an origin of thought. It's a principality. That's why, you know, there's all forms of principalities now across the world, you know, that are gateways for the enemy to, to work through, you know, people's minds or even organizations, you know, that, that, that were first created by a thought, by an idea, by a narrative. Then, then that narrative strengthens itself and becomes a gateway through which the enemy works and gets a foothold in someone's mind, life. Then that entity takes over and it becomes a real being. It's a real being. It's a spirit. It's a spiritual thought first tempted by thought. You know, when the enemy was in the garden with Adam and Eve, he said, did God really say that you right. can't eat of that tree? In right. other words, deception is creeping at the door. And they they were tempted by the thought. Yeah. They let the enemy come through through a principality, an origin yeah. of thought. And before they knew it, 
They were fallen, separated from God, and then evil tumbles out, sin. That's powerful. So it's, that, it's, yeah, that word you're talking about in Genesis 3, it talks about the fall of man when Satan came to tempt. Right. That word there in the Hebrew, interesting, is called nasha. Mm. And nasha means to be deluded in the mind. Right. The serpent deceived Eve in her thinking, in her mind, Right. Exactly what you were just saying. Very powerful. Very so, powerful. So as you said, you know, he, uh, Jesus went about doing good, healing all, delivering all that we were oppressed by the devil. You know, it, it, you know, he stood up on the first day of his ministry and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captive and the opening of the prison to then get down to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So he comes to, to set the captive free, to break the chains, and he did it with me in a, in a moment. Wow. Now, some people, they need more moments. Yes, yeah. yeah. Some people have a kind of a drip, drip fed encounter with the Lord and they become, yeah. they become free. Uh, and there are areas of our life where we become free over, over years or even decades. Right. Um, but there are moments in our life where the Lord shows you his power in such a profound way. It's called a deliverance where he just sets yeah. you free. Boom, yeah. you're, you're, you're free. And it's very powerful. So that happened to me. I'm thankful. Yeah, you you, you were converted. I mean, I Woo! had a very similar experience um, where it, it was a dramatic conversion um, yeah. and, uh, and, 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 and was delivered as well. I didn't realize that through my participation in a lot of new age activities and different things like that, I had invited demonic spirits into my life that were oppressing me. And right. uh, when I was delivered from that, it was like I had a whole new perspective to life. I didn't realize there were controlling forces in me. I'd never heard of deliverance. I'd never heard of demons. All, I, all I'd known is psychology, psychology, psychology. Yeah. Like you, when a pastor explained to me the truth of God's word, just like that, I was released and set free. And yeah. um, it's powerful. It's so powerful. I think com comparatively, you know, some people lock you up just by nature of being around them. You know, you feel like you're walking on eggshells. You know, you can't, right. say, you can't say that or God forbid I should say this or, you know, just be me or blah, blah, blah or whatever. And sure, there are areas we all need to change in our life, but some people by nature lock you, they intimidate you and lock you up. It's the same with the enemy. The enemy comes to shrink your world. He comes to lock you up or he comes to tempt you in a separate direction. Um, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but ends in death. Mm. So, you know, the, the enemy says, oh, come and look at this. It look, you know, smells right, looks right, tastes right. Uh, you know, you think it's right, but in the end, its fruit is is death yes. and uh, it locks you up. So I, I think, you know, we need to reevaluate our life at every turn yeah. and consistently do that as we walk through life to ensure that liberty in Jesus, true liberty is and in purity and holiness is found in him. That's where the safety is. That's where the. The, the fruit is that's where the beautiful glory of God is Amen. and that's where eternal life is it's in Amen. and so many people within the entertainment industry chasing the elusive dream of just I mean you've been around a lot of celebrities um, myself to a lesser degree but nonetheless they were there um, yeah. There, there seems to be something within, um, maybe you can explain it better. Is it is it chasing the desire to, is there a deficiency in oneself that needs the acclaim or the attention or the applause of others um, to feel better about yourself? When that's removed, that's when the trouble begins? Have you? Yeah, I think, I think. Every human being, there's a sense of finding affirmation or validation um, from from people. Um, particularly, that starts in the home, you know, with our with our parents. But beyond all of that, I think the safety net of of having faith in God is that you find beyond people affirmation and validation in Christ, in God. And once that kisses on your life, you it's like you no longer need to seek that. 
Um, but I, but I think <laughs> it's a big conversation. I'm still trying to work it out myself. But I think in the entertainment business, I think you're you're thrust into a realm of you know all eyes are on you. Um, and when you taste the fruit of what that provides, that affirmation or the money or the fame or the level of opportunity that it provides for you, there's something in the soul and in the in the ego that desires more of that. It wants more of that platform. It wants more of that experience because it makes me feel good or it makes me feel better. Um, now, that can all turn on you. Um, right. On a dime, it really can, and it but, does. And a lot of entertainers have, where it has yeah. changed, and they yeah. just can't cope with the reality of life. They're caught up in the image that's been created, and then it becomes this huge chasm of loss that they have to fill yeah. with vices, with other vices. Absolutely, and they do. And then it's then it becomes escapism from right. the thing that fueled them to get where they are, or, or the thing they thought they wanted, which was, you know, the validation of, of man and the applause of people and the money that it provided. When they go to the top of the mountain and they realize, hey, this can't give me what only a relationship with God can give me, then they start to isolate themselves, fuel it with alcohol or numb themselves. Life is messy, man. You know, yeah. life is yeah. messy and, yeah. and a lot more messy when... Yeah when events are hastened into your life more quickly than they, they should be at a young age, yeah. when you don't have the wisdom yeah, uh, to absolutely. be able to handle that level of right. opportunity. Yeah. And I certainly, you know, just for the sake of the listeners, I'm not suggesting that people, everyone in the entertainment industry has got problems. No. I'm not suggesting that at all. No. In Some, fact, what I'm, yeah. I'm, what I'm saying is that people in the entertainment industry have talent. They've got giftings, they've got abilities, and that's what's, you know, so I want to make that clear. I'm certainly not suggesting if no, you're in the entertainment think, industry, you've got problems. <laughs> well, I think, uh, yeah, but it's very few and far between that, that people in the entertainment business actually get to live out a strong faith, you know, and actually make right. it through, unfortunately, because of all those factors that are, that are around them. But, yes, if it's your calling, there's a difference between career and calling, if you believe it's your calling, then go and live your best life. Make an impact for Christ in the best way that you can. But if it's yeah. a career, ugh, you know, you're on, Good. I think you're on shaky ground. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, wow. I mean, that, I, look, I, that's just, that was fantastic. Thank you for bearing your soul and just opening up. I, I just know in my spirit, this is helping people. This is really blessing some people. Right. Uh, hearing that. Um, so you're in the Hillsong, you know, machine. You're now performing in front of thousands of people globally. You're recording yeah. albums. Life's good. And then you met a young lady. Is that right? <laughs> oh, and she, all of a sudden, she you're couldn't in the UK it. in church yeah. life, worshipping, and you're in part of a major church in England called the Abundant Life Church. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I met Beth, my wife. She couldn't resist me. <laughs> no, I think it was the other way around, as you can see there. Um, but, yeah, so we met in Sydney, moved to the UK. Um, uh, I worked for her father for 11 years at Abundant Life Church under his great leadership. And uh, we both worked at church, actually. And, yeah, there's our beautiful family, Jonah and Sienna. Jonah's now nearly 14. Sienna has just turned 11. And, um, yeah, Beth and I also pioneered our own church after we left Abundant Life Church, did that for six years, and now I'm more kind of in itinerant ministry and I'm, I'm doing other things uh, at the moment as well. Wow, 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 wow. So um, you pastored for six years? Yes. Did you enjoy that? Yeah, that was – it started off brilliantly, Gary, you know, but as you'll know with a global pandemic in the middle of pioneering a new work, Right. You know, it's difficult to to get, you know, to pioneer a church. You'll know you've, you've pioneered for 25 years. Right. And um, but having a global pandemic in the middle, we lost oh, about. No. <laughs> yeah, we lost about 50 percent of the yeah. the church um, during that time. And then people started to come back slowly and sporadically. And a lot of the young families just 
it's like the rhythm of their life changed and other priorities crept in. So there was that sense of building back um, afterwards, which was quite discouraging. Um, but in, in all of that, you know, I felt in the trenches and, and felt like I could be giving a lot more. And I was being asked by other pastors, leaders and organizations to come and teach and train on a, on a worship creative level as well. So, you know, I, I had to listen to the Lord and lay the church down and move into a new season. And Beth works for a charity called Compassion as well. So consequently, she's out and about doing lots of stuff as well. So it's worked really well to, you know, walk forward into a new season. Into yeah. a new season. I'm currently uh, just about to launch something called Enhance Worship Academy. Yeah. As well, Enhance Worship Academy. And it's on my website. Um, so, yeah, which is markstevenshome.com, www.markstevenshome.com. So I'm just about to launch that across the country over here. I'm really excited about it because it gives me an opportunity to pour into the creative community, the worship community. Everyone's a worshiper and should be, yeah. a worshiper, you know, who knows Christ. And um, so it's a great opportunity to teach. Well, train. I say everyone is a worshiper. If you're not worshiping Christ, you're worshiping something. <laughs> That's yes. for sure. There's no question yeah. about that. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, worship's all about what you add value to, you know. It's it's yeah. what you value the most. Yeah. And um, so I think following a trail of your time, your energy, your, your finances will give you a pretty good idea of what you value the most. So uh, the and website is markstevenshome.com. It's right there, viewers. You can, you can check that out. Um, now, you've also got here, um, uh, where are we? Praise God. Your Facebook dot com yes. um, forward slash mark stevens music so yes. you've also got some great music that people can listen to and download yep. is that right that's right that's right yeah on itunes you can uh, you can get my stuff on itunes yeah and uh and yeah links are through instagram uh, facebook there you go i need to get everything right. under one banner in terms of it's difficult to get these strap lines isn't it because other yeah. people so there you go. Well, that's okay. They can always go back and pause it, and all the information is there for for the viewers to uh, to have a look at. Um, and uh, probably the website might be the best place to go. Um, also, uh, just want to let people know is that Mark has got a book that he's written. Tell us about your book. Yeah. So the the book is just a collection of messages that are that are dear to my heart that I've either taught uh, in training over the years. So I captured a few of those, but the first three chapters are all about the in-depth part of my testimony uh, of my coming to Christ. There's a lot more detail in there uh, if you're if you're interested in, in being encouraged by that. And then like I said, it opens up into other things that can strengthen you and your faith, like your worship journey or teaching and training. Yeah. So, I've captured that in, I think, about 10 different chapters. Uh, and in the, the best book. place to get that book is iBooks. It's on iBooks, yeah. Right, go to iBooks. That's and, it. Um, I, I can guarantee you the book Strength for the Road by Mark Stevens. What a great read that is. It's always, um, it's always, it's wonderful to hear of people's journeys in life, you know, and particularly you've got such an amazing story of what um, God has done for you. And, um, and, and, you know, I, I'm certainly really proud, you know, to have, you know, known you when we were kids, really. We were just teenagers. We were just kids. Uh, but to see the journey of what God has done for you, Mark, is, is absolutely phenomenal. And you ought to be very, very proud of yourself. And I know that, you know, to see you with your, your, your pride and joy is your wife and your two children. Um, and just that, to see that and... Um, the, the worship ministry that you got is absolutely um, phenomenal. Um, it, it really is wonderful. Do you have any um, closing thoughts that you'd like to make just from your heart, talking as a shepherd? Because you are, you're a shepherd, you're a minister of the gospel now. Um, for people who may be on a journey or maybe they're, they're struggling or maybe they've, they've, they've watched this and they're just, you know, uh, they don't know what to do next. What would you yeah. say to people in that kind of realm? 
I think we live in, in really interesting days, you know, where we are crowded out by so many voices. And I think sometimes it's difficult to see the wood for the trees. You know, all you do is you flick on the news or the television and you're bombarded with all kinds of different ideologies and narratives and, and uh, things that people are pushing towards you and what have you. So I guess my cry in the middle of all of that is to is to encourage you to see the wood for the trees, to, to cut away a lot of the, the nonsense or stuff that, that doesn't really mean much in the eyes of eternity, I guess. And um, to encourage you to understand that, that you were put on the planet by a loving God. And no matter the circumstances that you, that you came through or that you lived through um, in terms of getting you here on the planet, um, no matter what, has happened in your world, I, I would love you to remember that you are built for purpose, that you are built for significance, that everyone on the planet has a reason for being here. And God is in his sovereignty and in his wisdom and in his power has orchestrated events so that you might enjoy this thing called life. My heart cry is that I wouldn't want you to miss the very reason why you're here. And I wouldn't want you to miss an opportunity to know the one who put you here. So I guess I feel like it's my job, my responsibility to, to shout out as much as I can, you, you need to know Jesus. Wow. That's beautiful. <laughs> and um, so, you know, on the back of this, if you have the opportunity to hear this, um, I would encourage you to pray, to talk to God, even if you don't hear anything back. Um, to get yourself a Bible, to start to become curious about this thing called faith, faith in Christ, the Christian faith. And, um, yeah, I would get switched on to that as, as quickly as I possibly uh, could. And, and lastly, also, you know, we, we are wired for relationship as people. Relationships matter, but having the right relationships matters more. And, uh, you know, relation, relationships are circles. So you've got to be careful what circle you are in. You mm. know, show me, show me your five closest friends and I'll show you who you're going to become in the next five years. So I would wow. encourage you to make some adjustments relationally. Be strong if you need to do that to free you up to walk into a brand new future for yourself. Wow, that is so good. That is so good. Um, Mark, it's been an absolute joy and we've gone way over time, but you know what? It was just oh, fascinating God. to talk yeah, with too. you and hear your, your journey. Um, we're really praying uh, about getting you into Australia, back to Australia and back preaching. And we'd love to see you preach at Awesome Church and sing some songs. And uh, <laughs> I'm prophesying that's going to happen yes. in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm already um, there. <laughs> yeah, praise God. Um, <laughs> Can I also just say, viewers, that Mark's got this great new initiative called Enhance Worship Academy. And yeah. um, look, this is going to be a ministry that's going to touch many churches, right. many people. It's going to raise up worship leaders. It's going to raise up ministry. If you would like to donate towards that, the information is right there at the bottom Thank of you. the screen. Go there now and send an offering. If this message has blessed you tonight, send it. Send it to this ministry, the Enhance Worship Academy, and I can guarantee you that's going to go towards being a great blessing to many, many people's lives. Um, and the information is right there for you to do that. Um, Mark Stevens, Pastor Thanks. Mark Stevens. Well, yes. Pastor Gary Costello. <laughs> Who would ever thought all these years later we, we, we would be pastors praise god but there you oh, go no. god, god, god has a sense of humor right yes he does it's, <laughs> wrong. it's absolutely right and listen i commend you um gary and well done for stepping out and doing what you're doing and, Thank and you. you know great days ahead for awesome church for your ministry for your family it's going to get you. better and better and better i just know it in jesus oh, name. Amen. Brother, would you pray for people as we close yes. would you pray a blessing come on everyone that's watching this just just 
close your eyes, lift your hands to heaven, and let Pastor Mark Stevens bring a blessing <laughs> over your life. Amen. Amen. Well, Father, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the name of Jesus and the power that resides uh, in that name. Lord, I pray for every listener. Lord, I pray for every individual and every family and community that they represent. Lord, I pray that the hand of the Lord would be upon them, that a sense of your tangible presence and power would bless them, would strengthen them, would cause them, Lord, to, to would cause a, stip, a skip in their step today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you'd supernaturally continue to provide for them, to yes. bless them, Lord, to ensure them that you are with them and for them and that you can make a way where there seems no way. Lord, when we, when we don't think there's a way out, you can make a way out. You've got a thousand ways to bless us, Lord. Yes. So, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, bless them, increase them, and strengthen them in Jesus' name. Lord, you say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it even entered into their heart today the things that you've prepared for them because you love them, because yeah. you want to bless them. I pray that they'd, they'd walk away from this moment, Lord, this interview, knowing, Lord, that you want to bless them, prosper them, help them uh, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you for Gary, his family, and his church. Continue to bless all he's doing and reaching for in this season. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And Heavenly Father, I just lift up Mark, his wife, Beth, and the children, his ministry, the calling that you've placed on his life. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done in him. Thank you for the blessing and the anointing and the calling and the giftings and the talents and abilities that he is now using for your kingdom. And I just pray that new doors of opportunity are going to open up. And I just pray, Father God, that the best Years of Mark's life and ministry are ahead of him. Yeah. And I pray that even from today, new doors of opportunities will open up and your favor and your goodness will be upon him in Jesus' name. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Yes. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Thank you, man. Oh, bless you. you. Thank and you. We'll see you again soon. You too. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Well, there you have it, saints. Praise God. What a wonderful interview that was. Hey, if you enjoyed that, would you please uh, give a like, uh, leave a comment, but more than anything, share it. Share this interview because I know that it will bless people. It will touch people's lives when they hear this fascinating and, and so encouraging journey of just what God has done in Mark's life. And I know that it'll be a great blessing for all of you. So, um, before you go, what's coming up at Awesome Church? Well, some great things are coming up at Awesome Church. This Sunday at 10 a.m., I will be continuing my series on the 2023, The Glory of God. That's our theme for this year. We're going to be gathering at 4 Euston Street, Rydalmere, in our new worship center. And, um, man, let me tell you, we've been having, there's revival at Awesome Church. Uh, just go to our YouTube channel, look at the meetings, look at what God's doing. Yesterday, we, uh, my chief attendant, when I walked out, I needed to use the restroom and, and she grabbed me and she said, uh, Pastor Gary, where do we put all the people? And I just kind of looked at her and I said, well, I don't know, just, just shove them in there, somehow get them in there. And uh, it was overflowing, such a beautiful presence of God. So we're going to be gathering again this Sunday at 10 a.m., if you're in the Sydney region, why don't you come along and join us? You would be my guest at Awesome Church. Well, this is Gary Costello signing off for another episode of Gary Costello Live. We'll be back in a few weeks' time, and I'll be interviewing Bishop Tom Brown. Hallelujah. From Texas, USA. He's an Anglican bishop that is filled with the Holy Spirit, He's authored many, many, many books and uh, on healing, on deliverance in particular. He's ministered at Awesome Church a number of years ago. They were one of the biggest meetings we ever had. He will be my guest, and we're going to be talking about healing, deliverance, the power of God, what God's doing in the USA, and what God is doing around the globe right now. So it's going to be a fascinating interview. That's coming up in a few weeks' time, so look out for that. 
In the meantime, I want to wish you a big God bless you. Look forward to your company again soon. So be blessed. Have a great night. We'll see you again soon. Amen.